This is Clashes of the Week here on Talk Radio TV with me, Phil Dave. Now, this show wouldn't be complete without someone talking about vaccinations somewhere along the line. Well, wouldn't you know it, that very topic came up on Ian Collins' show recently. Though this time, just in case you thought it couldn't get any more controversial, it was the subject of vaccinating children against COVID. The debonair on afternoons discussed this with Dr. Bharat Pankania, senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. Of course, it's not mandatory, it's not even really being openly encouraged, but all the same, it can still cause a bit of a disagreement. Your um, initial response, Bharat, to that uh, non-urgent pre- assessment from the JCVI. Prevention is always better. Prevention is always better than uh, risking a infection and then saying to yourself, uh, I'll take my chance with this. So if you have a safe, um, predictable, and the key word is predictable, uh, vaccine, which will do something and protect you, it's much better, much better to do that than to say, well, I'll take a gamble with getting infected and most children are okay, therefore I will be okay. But I have got a vaccine for you, which is a predictable dose, a controlled dose, a controlled introduction to being immunized, and we know that they work and we know that they are safe. And, you know, to comment on your uh, your assertion that, well, you know, it's too much of an effort. It is not too much of an effort. We immunize our children all the time. And if we hadn't immunized our children, we would have a lot more illness. And therefore, as a personal measure, as a public health measure, immunizing and protecting our children is a good thing to do. But it's a case by case thing, isn't it? So you look at something, I'm thinking of measles is an obvious thing. You don't want kids to get measles. That could be a very, very tricky uh, illness for for, for children to deal with. Um, We we look at COVID. There's never, ever been any evidence that that particular age group is is at risk very much, if at all, in, in most cases, some exceptions to that. But they are very, very rare. And I always thought that in your world, in the world of medicine, that if something is a rarity, then you don't go around delivering medicine or vaccinations when there's hardly any chance of you getting ill from it. No. Um, Children have got ill. Children have missed school. Children have missed school a lot because they have got infected. Children have gone on to infect older people and older people have gone on to get admitted to hospital. All of these parameters... Very rare though, right? Very, Very rare. Tiny, tiny amounts of cases. No, 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 no. Look, yes, yes, yes. Whilst a small percentage of children have been very ill, it is not true to say that the children have not gone on to generate cases and those cases have ended up in hospital and some of them have been very right. ill. So they've become so a we protective have to look wall at the for others. Health perspective too. So we use kids as a human shield almost. Well, hold on a minute. I think those are emotive terms that you persistently use. I would like to point you to, we use the seasonal influenza vaccine personally for that very purpose, which is to immunize, protect them and protect the community. There's nothing different here. So when you give a, so just to clarify that, because many people, I think many parents listening to this, Barat will say, well, actually, I'd never... I'd never considered that was one of the reasons why I was giving my child a food, a flu vaccine uh, or any other uh, vaccine for that matter, that it's about protecting wider society. There's an implicit almost responsibility on me then, in addition to trying to keep my kid of healthy, course. to protect other people around. Even well, if my kid you... is perfectly healthy and statistically unlikely, almost impossible to end up in hospital, almost. No. With respect to seasonal influenza, this is what I would do. I want my child not to have influenza and I would like my child not to infect other people. It's as clear as that. And we've always done that. We've been doing it for many, many years. But I I, I don't think people consider a flu vaccine or any other vaccine in that capacity, do they? Well, I think it's about time we were absolutely upfront and educated people about why we do what we do. But we've been doing this. Uh, for a long time, we've been immunizing so that the person is protected and the community is also protected. Okay. We've so done this for a long time. Would it be fair, based on that then, to say that the main reason in the case of a healthy eight-year-old with no underlying conditions, the main reason to get them vaccinated would be not to protect them, but to protect other people? No, not true, because there are a lot of unknowns with this um, 
uh, virus. But they're not going to end up in hospital statistically. They're not going to get ill statistically. So that leaves the main reason, your words, is to protect others. Please, let me answer. Uh, the answer is as follows. We know what we know, and then there are unknowns. So out of the blue, a Omicron variant ar arose. Out of the blue, another variant can arise, which may cause suddenly severe illness in a different age group, i.e. the younger age group. We just don't know. But we, what we do know is that there is quite a lot of cross immunity and protection. And if I were in that situation where I don't know what's coming around the corner, right. but on the other hand, I do know that if I protect, there is a potential to have cross immunity and protection from a variant that may be causing severe disease. So we are, we are protecting against what might happen that hasn't yet happened because it's there are known one of unknowns. The considerations, absolutely. So the, yes. main, the main reasons then are what might happen and to protect other people, but not. So third down the list then would be the protection of the child. But also the third thing I would say is this. If I had to choose between get immunity by infection or get immunity by immunization, I would always choose immunity by immunization because it is controlled. Even for an eight-year-old, Barat? Even yes, for I an eight-year-old? Yes, I would. Who's not yeah, going to really... We do that all the time, Ian. We do that. Yes, absolutely. There is no... This vaccine is not going to harm our children. On the other hand, this vaccine is going to protect them and it's protecting them in a controlled manner. You know, I have to say that I completely agree that when it comes to medical matters, prevention is always better than cure. Having said that, I do have to stress that I've never personally been the biggest fan of taking a vaccination for something that's a virus. Now, I'm all in favor of vaccinating against a disease because then you know you can cure it, if not eradicate it altogether. All of that to one side. Obviously, I'm no medical expert, even if I am wearing a white coat. And if someone as wise as Dr. Barris is saying, that he believes that it is indeed okay for children to be vaccinated against COVID, well, then I would only encourage anyone to follow medical advice. Curious, though, how that was openly compared to influenza. That has to be the first time I think I've actually heard a medical professional comfortably implying that there is indeed a parallel between COVID and flu. How many months have we heard that you can't compare COVID to other coronaviruses? It's nothing like it. And yet just under two years after we started, here we are. Of course, here at the home of common sense, we would only ever encourage you to exercise caution. But at the same time, let's learn to live with this, shall we? This is Talk Radio TV's Clashes of the Week. Up next. If we don't do that properly, that is seriously dangerous. Carol. Don't forget, the more <clears throat> infections I mean, there are, the more is... likelihood... Can I, can I, can I, Brian, could you do me a favour and listen to somebody else for just a second? Many people <laughs> are messaging in saying, and I quote... Your comment, sir, needs picking up upon. 100 people a day are dying with COVID, not of it. Of course, wording can be such a minor detail, and yet the ramifications could always be huge. Do people die from or with COVID? Something that very few have ever been able to answer. That's a battle for Jeremy Kyle and his guests, and that's coming up after this. This is Clashes of the Week with me, Phil Dave. And now it's official. If you test positive with COVID, you now no longer legally need to self-isolate. Some might say hallelujah. Others might say that's ridiculous. Whatever your stance is, thems are now the rules. It's officially guidance to stay at home rather than mandatory. Well, this was discussed recently on Drive Time. Jeremy Kyle spoke with Brian Fisher, a semi-retired GP in London, and Professor Carol Sikora, consultant oncologist and founding dean of the University of Buckingham Medical School. Did you hear about the two medical professionals that couldn't agree on how best to treat a medical complaint? Uh, Brian, let's start with you, if we can. Um, uh, a semi-retired GP in London. You are, are quite adamant that restrictions should be retained. Why is that, sir? Yeah, I'd, I'd call them, and I think we should all call them protections, not restrictions. Um, and I think it's foolhardy to remove them in this way. Um, risks remain for nearly 4 million people with diseases that make them vulnerable, and also in particular for disabled people who have been more or less totally neglected through the pandemic. 60% of deaths have been disabled people. The additional booster that's recommended by the JCVI just today shows that the risk remains real. Um, we have 68,000 cases a day, one in 20 people infected, 
100 people die from COVID every day. I mean, it's a very serious situation. And by making all these changes, we're affecting people in a very serious way. It's a terrible choice for lowest paid workers going to work infected with COVID or risk losing income by isolating at home. This is social and employment pressure to spread a bug and employees and the self-employed having to fight not going to work. Such high levels of infection breed new variants. Um, and the, if the protection measures are stopped, then the University of Warwick um, suggests that the potential for increasing transmission um, is, would increase by about 25 to 80 percent. I, I so, will say I will say this, Brian, um, <clears throat> and my job is not here to, to say one thing or t'other. And I, and I want to assure both of you of that and people listening. It's up to them. Uh, it's 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 how they the people listening and watching this decide. Um, Carol, the thing I can't get right, and I'm I am not an expert. You two are is we have lived in a country who for two years, all I have heard every single day is people saying, when are we going to be free of this? When are we going out? When are we going to get out of this? I've seen a prime minister stood at a lectern with 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 two scientists who've become famous in their own rights, who have said repeatedly about scientific information, scientific information. They're nowhere to be seen now, by the way. I don't know whether that's a different thing. Isn't it time if I, I guess there's no way of putting this correctly because Brian will say people are dying. People die of the flu. People die of many, many things. Is it not now a time where we should take personal responsibility and get on with our lives? Because otherwise, are we not going to be stuck in this forever? Exactly so. And Brian's made some very cogent points. Now, I don't <coughs> disagree with him on some of them. But we've got to look at the bigger picture. It's very easy to go into a pandemic and put all dramatic things, lockdown, masks, all the other things we've had. It's much more difficult to time, to nuance, to use the word that's often banded about for the last two years, the point to which you come out of it. Look, there are only 335 people on ventilators um, because of COVID at the moment in the UK. It's a very small amount. It's very sad for those that have that. Some of them have got other illnesses, and that's why they require uh, lung support, basically. But for the rest of society, we've got to do something. We've got to get out of this. You know, we spent £37 billion on test and trace, a complete failure. Vaccines, fantastic. Logistics, just fantastic. And, you know, the plan to vaccinate people over 75 and the vulnerable with a fourth injection, that's good. But we've got to get back to normal. 1,750 people die every day, 400 of them with cancer, which is my specialty. And, you know, if you put your money onto COVID, when it's essentially over, you're not going to treat other diseases, cancer, heart disease. Strength. Jump in, Brian, jump in, it's please. It's not essentially over. It's absolutely not essentially. You, have, you haven't mentioned long COVID either. Um, this isn't just about killing people, which it does. It's also about disabling people perhaps for years or even for the rest of their lives. But can I jump in we as are, I'm not medical, not Brian? This. Can I jump in and grab something? Yet, uh, can I jump in and ask you something that Pre uh, Professor Probably. Carroll just said? Uh, tell me tell me if this is relevant. I mean, even I'm amazed by this. Carroll just said, only, sorry, and he, and he qualified it by saying, obviously for those families, very difficult. only 335 people in the whole of the UK are on ventilators due to COVID. Fact, Yes. I presume that's right. I mean, you uh, presume, yeah, right. and I, the I other sixty-nine million nine hundred ninety-six thousand are not. There has to come a point, isn't there, where we go? Sorry, but we've got to move on. There has to be that, isn't there, Brian? Because the problem is, yes, is yes, is, that, that does. But how do it, you profess moving on then, when it seems that certain parts of the medical profession? want to keep us held back for every time there's a move forward. Somebody in the medical profession says, "No, hold on, this is dangerous." It's not about holding back. It's finding the right protections in the right place. And of course, eventually we will live with this virus, but living with it at the moment means dying from it. It's not learning to live with it. It's learning to die. But won't people it. always and die from things? Yes, of course they will. But we have, um, 
you know, laws that protect us from driving into other people. We have all sorts of laws that you would count as being restrictions. All right, let me, let me put it, let me put it another, let me put it another way, Brian. Let me put it another way for businesses and for people listening to you today, right? And, And I'm going to be very direct. People have been dying with restrictions in place. So there's absolutely no guarantee that those restrictions have protected us. I, I rem- People have been dying whilst there have been restrictions. That's an absolute fact. The thing is, businesses are going bust. People are suffering long-term mental health issues as well as long-term COVID. Yes. And those people want to get on with their lives. And it's such a contentious issue. Of course it's contentious. But... Give me something. Give the people cynically listening, saying this guy just is part of the medical profession that never want to move on. What would you say to those people, Brian? Of course I want to move on. I want us to live well with this virus like other viruses. Um, We have made enormous progression with uh, vaccinations and with all sorts of medical advances as a result of this um, pandemic. But this is not the time to be relaxing everything. What I think we should be doing is that masks should be mandatory in places like transport and theatres. Mask wearing is simple. It doesn't affect the economy. It shows respect for others. Testing should remain. It should be have free LF, um, lateral flow tests. Don't forget that if we, if we stop these things or make them much more difficult, we are blinding ourselves by reducing testing and isolation it robs us of the most fundamental means of controlling the spread of this virus. So, of course, we will, things are changing. It's, it's wonderful that there are so few people in ICU for COVID. I mean, that is, that is wonderful. Um, but this is not the time to throw all caution to the winds. Um, I'm not the only person, it's not just the medical profession that is saying this. Um, we also want self-isolation with support for those infected. So we need much better support, uh, better ventilation in schools. And it's not clear to me to what degree we're maintaining surveillance data to, uh, to pick up new variants. If we don't do that properly, that is seriously dangerous. Carol, don't forget, the more <clears throat> infections there I mean, are, the more is... likelihood... Can I, can I, I Brian, could you do me a favour and listen to somebody else for just a second? Many people are messaging in saying, and I quote... Your comment, sir, needs picking up upon. 100 people a day are dying with COVID, not of it. I understand that it is as a result of Let Carol speak, Brian, if you wouldn't mind. Let Carol have a chat. Brian, you do make some good points, but the total picture is you'll never give up. There's got to be a point at which we say COVID is endemic. It's just like the flu. It's just like the common cold. It will kill people. People have to take precautions. We have to be immunized if you're worried about it. It's an individual decision if you wear a mask on a train or on the bus. It can't be any other way. We've got to come out of it. If you think of my cancer patients, many have died because of COVID, because Mm. they haven't got treatment quickly, partly because they're too scared, being too scared to use the NHS, partly because the NHS wasn't open for them in the normal way. We've got to come to the end of that. People are always going to die. As I said, 1,750 people die in the UK every single day. And the number with COVID is dropping precipitously. Number of infection, number of hospitalizations, number of ventilations, and number of deaths are really dropping. And now is the time. It's ready. And Boris, love him or hate him, He's made the right call here, I can tell you. And I think most doctors would agree with that, Brian. Most of us think it's time to move on. We have to have precautions. We have to look for new variants. You're quite right there. We have to have systems in place to pick up new viruses, not SARS, other new viruses that may come to this country. We just can't stop society and you know it's a political thing as well you know the Labour Party are going to make a noise about it uh, uh you know Kistama's going to say things that's political game Scotland will do something different from Boris just to show they can Wales you know you have to go through the seven tunnel and wear a mask as you go through the tunnel uh, but they announced that no one does but you have to go through that fast it's a theatre And most of the precautions we do are purely theatrical to keep people happy for the politicians. So let's come to an end. Let's 
move on and get a life and carry on with normal health care and normal economy. I've always said my biggest concern over the focus on COVID was the hundreds of thousands of individuals who have other conditions. Now, I don't deny there are some people who do go through the most torrid time with COVID. And believe me, back in March 2020, I was one of them. However, even when I was at my worst during that time, at no stage did I think it was sensible for the world to grind to a halt. Now, obviously, I'm speaking as a non-medical person here, but I would suggest that there's only one thing that's certain in life, and frankly, that is death. Now, I'm sorry if that sounds a bit morbid, but it's basically true. This is not living. We have just got to get on with our lives. For however long we are on this planet, restricting people from doing something that is perfectly reasonable, such as being in crowded places without having to cover one's face, is not too much to ask. Thank goodness that common sense appears to have shone through. I do wonder how different, though, the official figures would look if we noted the number of people who died from COVID as opposed to with. Still to come on Clashes of the Week. I know a number of small businesses. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm not letting you get away with that. I've not finished. I've not finished yet. No, 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 no. This is my this is my hour. You listen until you come on, young man. No, 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 no. I'll just go. You just if said you talk I'll... to me like that, I'll just walk out. You'll be on your own. But I learnt from no, the master. No, I don't care. No. <laughs> oh, dear. We may be one big family here at the home of Common Sense, but I fear once in a while, like many families, there are some arguments along the way. This time, it's between Nick Dubois and James Whale.